Tonight, Jody Wilson-Raybould speaks out. Would I have changed anything that I have done? I will not change my actions. The former minister on the SNC-Lavalin affair, that damning ethics report, and her former boss. But Justin Trudeau is not apologizing. It is posing a severe challenge to law and order in Hong Kong. An uneasy calm. Chinese forces gather near Hong Kong's border as protesters prepare to take to the streets again. Is Beijing about to intervene? And this sound, it was intense. It shook me inside. It was an explosion. It sounded like a bomb went off. A car crash ruptures a gas line, causing an explosion in Ontario. The apparent reason, impaired driving. This is The National. I'm not going to apologize. Justin Trudeau repeated those five words today as he faces mounting pressure to do that very thing, to say he's sorry for the way he handled the SNC-Lavalin affair. A searing indictment of the Prime Minister found that he broke ethics laws by repeatedly and improperly pressuring his former Attorney General. Tonight, Jody Wilson-Raybould herself is speaking out about what has shocked even her and why she says Canadians deserve an apology. Katie Simpson has more. Well, hello. Feeling vindicated, Jody Wilson-Raybould says she's grateful for the Ethics Commissioner's report, a document that shed new light on the SNC-Lavalin affair for her. She didn't know how intense the firm's lobbying campaign was, nor did she know about the legal opinions it quietly gathered from former Supreme Court justices as a way to bolster its case. That came as a, a great surprise to me. Again, I had no knowledge of those either. She says it's time for the Prime Minister to say sorry. The Commissioner says Justin Trudeau broke the Conflict of Interest Act by flagrantly attempting to bend the will of his former Attorney General in a bid to grant SNC-Lavalin a plea deal of sorts to escape criminal prosecution. These are the kinds of things for which Canadians want an apology, I believe. Fat chance, says Trudeau. I was happy to take uh, all the questions yesterday. Uh, I'm not going to apologize for standing up for Canadians' jobs because that's my job. Election-ready cabinet ministers from coast to coast dutifully stood by their leader today. The Prime Minister has my full trust, full confidence. I personally have full confidence in the Prime Minister. What the Prime Minister was doing was uh, protecting jobs and uh, I appreciate that. While Liberals try to change the subject, the opposition is all too happy to revisit the scandal. So, uh, ultimately, if he won't be responsible for his own actions, Canadians will hold him responsible on October 21st. Conservative leader Andrew Scheer has asked the RCMP to investigate. Wilson Raybould is standing by her earlier comments that she believes nothing criminal happened based on what she knows. But she admits she doesn't have the full picture. I leave it to the RCM police to determine if there's other relevant information um, that's pertinent to the question. The opposition wants to explore the commissioner's report further and have called an emergency meeting of the Ethics Committee for next Wednesday to try and start that process. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. So you just heard Jody Wilson-Raybould say that she's surprised at how aggressively SNC-Lavalin lobbied the government to avoid a criminal trial. And she spoke more about that with Vashi Capellos on CBC News Network's Power in Politics. Did you feel that the level of engagement at the time was inappropriate? And if so, did you do anything about it? Well, I, I, I was aware that there were meetings. I, I didn't know the nature of those meetings or, or what was said. Um, Thing. I had discussions with former colleagues of mine that had expressed that they had had conversations, but the nature of those conversations and the detail of those conversations um, was not uh, uh, made available to me. The Prime Minister continues to reiterate that uh, you know, he was still, he says he, he won't apologize for standing up for Canadian jobs. He continues to reiterate that that was his motivation. Do you think that his motivation was different than that? And if so, what was it? 
Well, I can't speak to the motivation of the Prime Minister. I, I've heard him speak about jobs, and I don't think anybody would disagree that jobs are incredibly important um, to Canadians and to elected officials to ensure we do everything we can for uh, Canadians to have good, well-paying jobs. We all agree on that. The issue here and what was reflected in the Commissioner's report is around our institutions of government, around ensuring that we uphold their independence and uphold the rule of law. That was what I was doing in my role then as the Attorney General. I believe that's what Canadians um, care about um, and will take if there's lessons to be taken from this some eight months that we've been having this conversation is that we all must remain vigilant and we all have a role to play in ensuring our institutions the fundamental tenets of our democracy are upheld okay and so we have Vashi Capels joining us here from Ottawa and so Vashi if we take a step back I mean first of all what do you think the calculation is here for Jody Wilson-Raybould in going public today well, she has everything to gain by talking about this, first and foremost, because the ethics commissioner essentially corroborated everything she said happened. He said that, yes, the pressure applied to her was uh, unduly applied and that it was to further the private interests of SNC. That's what she's claimed all along. So she says, and she's used the word, she feels vindicated. The other thing is you got to look at this through the election lens. She is in a competitive riding. She's an independent. Any kind of sort of higher profile for her is a good thing right now. Well, and contrast that with the prime minister, I mean, who, who's in a very different situation. Yeah, he is. And I mean, the, the question is, you know, since she has so much to gain, does he have everything to lose? I don't think the answer to that at this juncture is clear. There is still another two months out from the election. I know it feels like it, it's tomorrow, but a lot of things can happen in those two months. And I think there are there is the potential for it to damage his brand. But we just don't know right now if that will certainly be the case in this election. Andrew. OK, the host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellas in Ottawa. Thanks very much. Now, as you've been hearing, the Prime Minister's defense in all of this has been that he was standing up for Canadians, that thousands of SNC-Lavalin jobs are on the line. Now, SNC-Lavalin is involved in billions of dollars of projects in Canada, from bridges to hospitals to subway lines. And if the engineering firm is successfully prosecuted for fraud and corruption, in a case going back well over a decade, it'll be barred from bidding on federal contracts for 10 years. So the stakes for a company with 9,000 employees in Canada are high. Now, about half of those employees work in Quebec, where the company was founded a century ago and still has its headquarters there, by the way. And Quebecers seem to have had a, a markedly different reaction to the scandal than the rest of the country. So is it a ballot box question there? Alison Northcott has the view from Quebec. It's one of the busiest neighbourhoods in the heart of Montreal. Si on Yvan Fugère lives in the federal riding of Laurier-Saint-Marie, which has been NDP since 2011, but is up for grabs in October. He says jobs, health care and the economy are the issues that will sway his vote. The election is still two months away, but it's clear Quebec ridings like this one will be important battlegrounds, particularly for the Liberals. Quebec is key to the Liberals' re-election plans. If they don't make gains in Quebec, it's very hard to see how they can win the election. La responsabilité. For years, this riding was held by former Bloc Québécois leader Gilles Duceppe. Now, with the NDP polling at less than 10 percent in Quebec, the Liberals see an opening. I've decided to run for the nomination. They've recruited well-known environmental activist Stephen Guilbeault to be their candidate here, highlighting an issue important to many Quebec voters. For sure, right now it's environment. I think it's, a, it's really important to talk about it. Still, some here are undecided, even conflicted about how they'll vote. And for some, the SNC-Lavalin affair has cast a shadow over the Liberals. I've been Liberal forever. You know, it touched me. That's what I believed in. But ever since lately, there's some things that are, I'm questioning myself about many things. But for others, SNC-Lavalin just doesn't factor in. I don't think we have the, the whole picture, you know, like some things we hear, something we read, but for sure there are some elements we don't know. And I think Justin Trudeau is very smart, so probably the way, uh, I don't know, like I, I, I trust him. <laughs> because it is a Quebec-based company, uh, we've seen in polling that Quebecers are a bit more forgiving uh, of the Prime Minister on this file. That could give the Liberals some leeway in Quebec as they try to make important gains here to offset potential losses in other provinces. 
Allison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Okay, let's move on. Ian, you've got your eyes on a very different political battleground. You're right, Andrew. After weeks of dramatic protests and increasing violence, many are watching Hong Kong, where for now, things are relatively quiet. But with more demonstrations planned for Sunday, that likely won't last. As Chris Brown reports, Beijing is watching closely. There was nothing subtle about the video that aired on China's state TV. It showed police practicing anti-riot drills in Shenzhen, right across the harbor from Hong Kong, with rows of heavily armored personnel carriers ready to deploy. Likening some of the protesters to terrorists, China's ambassador to the UK said his nation has enough force at hand to end the unrest quickly, warning if things deteriorate, it will act. They should not misjudge the situation and go down the wrong path. And earlier this week, the situation did deteriorate. There were ugly confrontations at the international airport, disrupting more than a thousand flights and fueling concerns the region's economy could tank if the unrest continues much longer. Though the situation in Hong Kong was calm today, protesters got an emotional boost with the release from jail of an earlier pro-democracy leader, Benny Tai. He faced off against Hong Kong's Chinese rulers in 2014 so-called Umbrella Revolution. I'm very proud that I can stand with them together at this very moment in Hong Kong. Just how likely a forceful Chinese intervention is remains hotly debated. Leading Chinese academics told a conference that Beijing is within its legal rights to invoke a state of emergency. But the young people driving the confrontations seem unfazed. We met some high school students handing out pamphlets. They wore masks so police couldn't identify them. We can't stop their troops from entering Hong Kong, 16-year-old Leon Wong told us. He's betting China's leadership is unwilling to deal with the diplomatic and economic fallout that it would face. Another major protest has been planned for Sunday, although authorities are refusing to give the event a permit. Nonetheless, the crowds are expected to be enormous. This weekend could be a critical moment. Chris Brown, CBC News, Hong Kong. Well, people in this neighborhood are spending another night away from home after a massive explosion prompted a very sudden evacuation last night in London, Ontario. It started with a bizarre car crash that set off a chain reaction of destructive events and at the heart of it, charges of impaired driving. Arthi Pohl takes us there. It all happened so quickly. I was just going to bed and I heard like, like a boom and an explosion and my microwave door came open and I thought that it had exploded. My backyard was just like lit orange. Um, and then I started screaming and yelling for my husband to wake up. And then within like one minute of this all happening, we looked out the window and the house was, it was gone. What many people didn't know at the time was that a car slammed into a house, rupturing a gas line which triggered fires in the residential area. Police went door to door telling people to get out fast. It was so bright, like, and then the smoke was just, just billowing up into the air. It, was, it looked pretty intense. Once daylight hit, the damage was even more clear. Seven homes destroyed, some completely flattened. Seven people taken to hospital, including four firefighters and two police officers. What I saw last night was a very significant explosion. Uh, in my career, I haven't seen an explosion of that magnitude. Uh, it was significant. As many as 100 homes were evacuated, including Maureen yeah, Riley's. She had to spend the night at a friend's place. But they came over and said, grab, like, grab what you can. But I wasn't thinking, because you, you don't. Like, I threw some cat food on the floor enough for a day, and we, and we got out. There's uh, like a couple bottles of shampoo and, and things like that. That's why Gavin Anderson opened up his brewery to accept donations today. Yeah. When we heard that, we just wanted to do what we could to uh, try and help the people that, that uh, were nearby and, and have been displaced. And, and we received overwhelming support from the community to, to help all these people that were affected. A 23-year-old woman from nearby Kitchener, Ontario, has been charged with five impaired driving-related offences. She'll be back in court on September 4th.
Arthi Pohl, CBC News, London, Ontario. Canada's Defence Minister has taken the unprecedented step of writing to the Ombudsman of the Canadian Armed Forces, directing him to root out racism in its ranks. Late last month, Harjit Sajjan wrote, over the past couple of years, there have been numerous stories regarding activities by CAF members which show that racism is an issue that we must rectify. We need to know the full extent to which racism is a problem. Tonight, we'll hear from someone who used to advise the forces on how to become more welcoming, but then he says he was subjected to debilitating intolerance. Ashley Burke has our exclusive story. So this award here is from the, uh, the uh, General of the Army. After a 17-year career, Steve Morrissey thought of sending these awards back. He says the Department of National Defense let him down when he needed help the most. I felt like I was abandoned. I had no, I had no support. I had nobody to turn to. Morrissey works as a computer technician at CFP Halifax. For years, he advised senior officials on how to make the military more inclusive for Indigenous members. He felt like he was on top of the world, but in 2015, it all came crashing down. It's tough. Morrissey says his military supervisor used a meaning language towards him. Wow. You know, he said, you know, he asked me if I was going to play the Indian card or, you know, uh, me and you have to have a powwow, you know, referring to a meeting. You know, that type of harassment, racial, racial harassment, I mean, it cuts deep. Morrissey filed an official harassment complaint here at CFB Halifax, a complaint he now regrets because of what happened next. Morrissey spent months working in the same office as the person he complained about. He says he felt ostracized and started suffering from anxiety and depression. He's been on sick leave since April. It's been hell. It's been, uh, yeah, it's, it's been just one complete disaster. Uh, the processes and the policies, harassment policies and everything are, are supposed to be there to protect you. And there was no protection. You know, I was left, I was hung out to dry. His family says Morrissey is now a shell of the man he used to be. If he doesn't pick up the phone, they fear the worst. What if he's dead? What if I find him? What am I going to be the one to find my brother? Because I've seen him just so down, so low, in such a dark place that, you know, that I never, ever would have expected Stephen to be. This is the third public allegation of racism in the past month at d and in Nova Scotia. The old boys club disappeared 20 years ago. The military says it doesn't tolerate harassment and is embracing diversity. Some mentalities need to be changed. This takes time. Uh, we don't have the perfect 100% solution yet, but we are working at it. But not soon enough for Morrissey. Not in a million years. I would not have my children join the military. He's telling his teenage son not to enlist. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Here are some of the other stories we're following tonight on The National. Nine months after allegations of sexual assault at a prestigious Toronto private school, an independent investigation has concluded bullying is still a systemic issue. Last fall, police charged seven students in connection to alleged incidents involving its junior football team. A committee found no significant change in the rates of student bullying since then. The school's interim president put out a response on YouTube. We must be better in this area, and we will. Bullying continues to be a societal issue, and the behavior speaks to how we treat one another. The committee made several recommendations, including rewriting codes of conduct and hiring more women as teachers and in leadership roles. The city of Saskatoon today announced it's fallen victim to a fraud scheme, losing more than a million dollars to a scammer. The city sent the money to someone posing as the chief financial officer of a prominent construction company online. It's alleged the fraudster asked for the company's banking information to be changed, so when the city made a contract payment, the funds went to the fraudster's bank account. There's no guarantee that any of the funds can be recovered or, or if, if portions of the funds can be recovered, what portion. Saskatoon police confirm they are investigating. Alberta has the country's highest minimum wage, but today the province took a step that could see one group of workers take a cut. 
Here's some background. The previous NDP government dramatically raised the general minimum wage from $10.20 an hour in 2015 to $15 in 2018. But workers who serve liquor got an even bigger boost because their old wage was just $9.20 an hour. When Premier Jason Kenney was in opposition, he promised he'd look at reinstating a lower minimum for those servers. Carolyn Dunn spoke with workers and bosses. Delphine Borger is winding down another lunch rush at the restaurant where she's worked as a server for four years. Today, she was appointed to a panel that will help steer Alberta's new minimum wage standards for people who serve liquor, like herself. I think that um, if we did lower it down from 15, at least have a difference, it'll make it uh, there more certainty for you to know that you have a job and you have hours in the week and um, there'll be more servers on the floor as well. So service will be better. Her boss and half-sister is Leslie Aquino, a board member of Restaurants Canada which lobbied against a wage rise for liquor servers in Alberta. Under the NDP it went up more than five dollars an hour in three years and she says that put pressure on the bottom line. So definitely there is a reduction in hours that I've seen steadily over the last three years. We try not to but it's unfortunate it's something we have to do. And that limits her employees' ability to earn tips. Jason Kenney promised to look at cutting the minimum wage for liquor servers, saying it would create jobs. The panel he appointed today is heavily populated by restaurant owners, workers, as well as academics who have previously argued against the rapid increase. The minimum wage expert panel is an important part of the government's common sense plan, not only to get Alberta's working again, but also to provide and prove to investors that Alberta is indeed open for business. At this chicken restaurant, servers are clocking with disapproval. Andrew Sochuk says he couldn't make ends meet if his basic wage is cut. You'd have to rebudget everything, absolutely. You have to reevaluate everything and um, maybe even look for another job. But his boss is one of hundreds of Alberta restaurant owners who have vowed they won't cut back the wage. Paying them a lesser wage and waiting on tips is hoping that the customers pay in your server's wage rather than the boss and the business itself. The panel is expected to finish its study early in 2020. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. And still ahead on the national. First, Flint, Michigan. Now, Newark. We go to the latest American city under a water crisis thanks to lead in the pipes. Plus, a new way to fight superbugs by unleashing a virus. And the mystery gripping suburban Virginia. I woke up the morning of Sunday, August 11th, looked out my front door and found a tube TV. And about 10 minutes later, my neighbor called, Stuart, and he said, oh my gosh, Jeannie, did you get a TV too? <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> we will dig into this one just ahead. Right now, we're drinking water that is coming up out the ground. We don't know really the damage that it has already done to us because we've been drinking it for years. That's a woman in Newark, New Jersey, on her way to line up for safe drinking water. And Newark is the latest American city facing a growing crisis over contaminated tap water. And once again, the problem is lead, something that can cause permanent brain damage in children. And as Stephen D'Souza reports, experts say the city's attempt at a fix doesn't seem to be working. The cases of water pile in, the lineup grows, and for every bottle that goes out, the anger and frustration in Newark builds. For many residents, it's been months since they trusted the city's water supply. It makes me feel angry that it's a situation that wasn't controlled before it got this bad. From brushing teeth to cleaning produce to cooking, almost everything is done with bottled water. I hate that I have to take a shower and I just, like I close my mouth. I feel like I'm in, a th like in another country. The city gave out filters last October, but the fear is they're not working. Last week, the Environmental Protection Agency said some are ineffective, so the EPA ordered the city to hand out bottled water. A tainted water problem in low-income, mainly African-American neighborhoods has drawn comparisons to the crisis in Flint, Michigan. Officials here say the difference between Newark and Flint is that the water coming out of Newark's reservoirs is safe. The contamination occurs when it passes through lead service lines connecting some homes to the city's supply. 
New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy says because the EPA only tested three out of 38,000 filters, more testing is needed to see if they're working. And so we are acting in, to use an overused phrase, in an abundance of caution uh, and to, to make sure that we're getting out ahead of this. But activists sued the city last year, saying for months officials denied there was a problem and failed to quickly inform the public. I think any time EPA is saying you've you've got to hand your citizenry bottled water, we're in a health crisis. Environmental advocates say the underlying problem is crumbling infrastructure and it's bigger than Flint or Newark. Seems like maybe after Flint a lot of people hit the snooze button and weren't paying attention to this drinking water crisis that we have really across the country. Um, Newark is the alarm ringing again. Residents say they want the city to expand the number of homes eligible for free bottled water. Water is a human right. Fix it. The city says it has started to fix some lead service lines, but without money from the federal government, getting water from plastic, not the tap, may end up being more than a short-term fix. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Newark, New Jersey. Now, of course, the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, started making headlines about five years ago, and even now, it's still not quite over. To take you back, Flint's water woes started when it temporarily switched its water source to save money, but lead from the city's old pipes leached into the drinking water. People in 18,000 households, including nearly 9,000 children, they were drinking toxic water for almost two years until officials finally acknowledged the problem and started providing bottled water in January of 2016. Last year, the water was declared safe and the free bottled water program ended, but a court-ordered replacement of all those lead pipes is still ongoing, likely won't be complete until next year, and most residents still won't drink the tap water. Coming up on The National, we'll take you inside a Canadian landmark under renovation, my behind-the-scenes tour of the Massey Hall remodeling. And the newest weapon in the fight against evolving superbugs. His bacterial infection was resistant to all available antibiotics, and the doctors had run out of solutions. Until this one. We take you inside the Canadian lab changing the game. Next. But first, we want to tell you the story of a city that has turned out to support a heartbroken husband. Where there is deep grief, there was great love. A poignant note left by a stranger on a tribute wall to Margie Record. The 63-year-old was shot and killed alongside 21 others at an El Paso Walmart on August 3rd. And the loved one left grieving is her husband, Antonio Basco. We first met Basco a couple of days after the shooting. He carried a cross bearing his wife's name to a makeshift memorial for the victims. I never ever expected. We got over 22 years together. Yeah. It was, it was just a shock, and I knew something was wrong, but he's in a good place now. Basco has spent nearly every day here. Record was his only family, and he was afraid he'd have to say goodbye to her alone. So he decided to invite the public to her funeral tomorrow night. The response has been overwhelming. People from around the world are sending cards, condolences, donations, flowers, and hundreds say they will be there for Basco. He really loved her. He loved her quite a bit, and it and sounds as though that they had a great life together. He's kind of sad. He's kind of, you know, kind of worried about, you know, what, you know, what do I do now that she's gone? The service has been moved to a larger venue that can fit about 250 people, but the funeral director says he expects triple that. Welcome back. U.S. President Donald Trump is standing by his comments that two Muslim congresswomen should not be allowed to visit Israel. The things that they've said, uh, Omar, Talib, what they've said is uh, disgraceful. So I can't imagine why Israel would let them in. Rashida Talib and Ilhan Omar have been openly critical of Israel and were due to visit next week. The president tweeted earlier saying it would show great weakness if they were allowed in, and hours later the country announced it will be blocking the pair's visit.
And a frightening scene inside a passenger plane. The crash landed outside Moscow today. Shortly after takeoff, the plane hit a flock of birds, shutting down one engine, then the other. The landing gear was retracted, but the pilots managed to land in a cornfield. More than 70 people were injured, but no one died. Russian news media drew parallels to the miracle on the Hudson story. The Kremlin has called the pilots heroes. There's a new weapon in the fight against superbugs. They're called phages, a kind of virus. They've been used primarily by doctors in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. But now, as Cass Rusi explains, doctors in North America are realizing their power. A dream holiday for Canadian researcher Stephanie Strathdee and her husband in 2015 turned into a nightmare when he contracted a dangerous superbug infection. He was fully colonized with this organism and it was eating him alive from the inside out. By the time he was medevaced to a San Diego hospital, he was on life support. His bacterial infection was resistant to all available antibiotics and the doctors had run out of solutions. So doctors turn to a little used treatment called phage therapy. Phages are viruses that can't be seen with the naked eye. But under a sophisticated microscope, these bacteria killers look like space invaders. They target bacteria and infect it, finally destroying the cells from the inside. Now researchers are looking at all sorts of potential uses for phages. So these are the gels that we've created. Gels completely made out of bacteria killing phage viruses. Once we pack all these viruses into the gel, the solid, the gel itself starts to exhibit a range of, uh, a range of attractive properties that we can now start to use for various biomedical and environmental applications. The gel has the potential ability to regenerate or heal tissue. No antibiotics are needed. Imagine you have a wound dressing that's made of bacteriophages. This wound dressing can help heal the wound because it's antibacterial. The gel phage is in its early stages, but one day researchers hope it could be used on bandages. Let's get uh, one more blue pad. And for this Toronto plastic surgeon, targeted therapy with phages has important advantages over drugs. Any time that you can reduce the amount of antibiotics you're prescribing to someone and you have a local treatment is a great opportunity in, in clinical medicine. Phage therapy is still experimental in both the U.S. and Canada, and only a handful of researchers in North America are looking into it. But they say these superbug-killing viruses hold huge promise in saving lives at a time when some antibiotics no longer can. Cass Rusi, CBC News, Toronto. And still ahead on The National, the mysterious person leaving residents of a U.S. suburb presence, I guess? So at that point, you start thinking, well, what is this? Should I plug it in? Is there a message? Is it going to explode, et cetera? It definitely became a mystery and it kind of brought the neighborhood together. I'm Matthew Braga, in for Jamie Poisson. Tomorrow on CBC's daily news podcast, Front Burner, a reporter joins us from Kenora, Ontario, to explain why local authorities have decided to temporarily close the city's sole homeless shelter in the midst of a drug crisis. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. This has always been Canada's special music hall, just like uh, Carnegie is to New Yorkers. So the first time you do load in and you actually play, it's, it's tremendously thrilling. It was more than a year ago that I got to tour Toronto's Massey Hall with Getty Lee, the legendary frontman for Rush. <laughs> Back then, the venue was about to be shut down for an extensive restoration. Now, in June, Massey Hall turned 125, and I got a backstage pass to see how that's going. I brought along another musician with a long history with the hall. For generations, a cross-section of Canada has gathered here to watch ah, world leaders, day. boxers, and of course, musicians. But now, Massey Hall is closed, encased by scaffolding, in the midst of an extraordinary renovation. Massey Hall's director of operations, Grant Troop, took me for an exclusive look behind the scenes with a special guest, Blue Rodeo's Jim Cuddy, who's performed here more than 40 times. They met in a hurricane, standing near the shelter, out of the rain. 
Like many iconic Canadian performers, Cuddy speaks about this hall with reverence. One of the things that was nice about Massey Hall was it felt like you were being greeted when you walked in the door. You're coming down the middle, people were looking at each other from the balcony, see who got the best seats up front. Performers could certainly see everybody from the stage. So that level of intimacy, as well as the acoustics, those are the things that have to be preserved. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about right here, right now? Well, this is, you know, this is a bit sickening, right? Because yeah. all the memories that people imbued in the wood and the upholstery, that's all gone. Yeah. But I also recognize that, uh, that the, the Grand Old Hall was under siege. Mm -hmm. And if this preserves it for another 100 years, then that will have been worth it. 125 years of Canadian history has been stripped bare, and it's now being painstakingly restored. The first couple of weeks after we closed the hall and we were taking out the seats, the smell in here was awful. <laughs> <laughs> Atop the scaffolding is a temporary floor. It makes it easier for workers to get access to the ceiling. Listen to Cuddy's reaction when he gets his first look. Woo! I know. This is an eye-opener. Holy Christ! This is something else. This is incredible. All of this work is original 1894 work that demises the overall ceiling structure of the hall. And, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's just an incredible experience to be up here and see the incredible detail and workmanship, much of which has been ex uh, obscured for the last 50 years because it's all been covered in this chicken wire. Chicken wire, inelegant for sure, but it was a cost-effective way to protect audiences from crumbling plaster. Like so much else in this building, the essence of what industrialist Hart Massey envisioned and what hundreds of workers created back in 1894 is being revealed and rebuilt. And you can see the, the dust and grime that's been coated on that over- 60-year-old gunk. 50 or 60 <laughs> years, exactly. A cigarette smoke and lint. So the, the process that the restorers are using is they're just slowly but surely working their way along, removing the chicken wire, making sure that these original stalactite details are intact, uh, filling cracks and prepping everything for eventual repainting. Are so, these 100% plaster? Uh, they're, n they're not solid, they're hollow. Oh, they're hollow, okay. Yeah, so they're, they're basically a cast, yeah. and inside they used a, a piece of burlap that they would wrap around this, this mold, and then they would form the stalactite, then they'd have a cast that would go on top of it, <laughs> and they would fill it. Uh, wow. We figured the reason they did, and they're all attached with two uh, quarter-inch nails. Really? Every, one, every one of them, yeah. Cuddy was fascinated to see up close the ceiling's soft curves and sharp edges, and to hear the sound when I clap my hands, something we do to help our editor sync up the cameras. Less reverb. What did you say, less reverb? I said there's less reverb than where the last one. Yeah, that's a good thing. There's something about every irregular shape is good for an acoustic building, right? So taking the arch and make, giving it a, a shape on the outside keeps deflecting the sound in all different ways instead of evenly. So it's all part of the reason why it sounds, sounded good. But the art of this refurbishing is not simply to recapture the hall's original sound, but also to make sure it will serve audiences in the next century. We're trying to reduce some of that echo effect or that slap back of sound when, when we push out all of this amplified sound now from this mass of PAs that will be ha hanging about right there, it's gonna hit those walls. And so we're trying to create an, an increased absorbency. By the way, if you don't like heights and climbing, here's a tip. Don't take a tour with Cuddy. We well, can't go up those ladders? <laughs> what you've missed is that Jim's obsessed about going up here, <laughs> but he's been told that he's not allowed Currently to. Currently so. told no. Yeah, well, I think that's gonna stay that way. Um, <laughs> he's but, working on it though. All right, so orient us here. Where are we standing right now? We're standing roughly 75 feet above the, the original stage surface or the, the last stage surface. So we're right over the stage area where Jim would have played many, many times. <laughs> oh man, yeah. look at this. The higher we climbed, the more we marveled at how in a building once lit by open flames, the old wood beams never burned. These purlins are 10 by 10s. And this is original timber that would have been harvested from Northern Ontario or BC. And it's quite amazing when you look at this and you consider that the hall was originally heated uh, and lit with gas, uh, that we're still here after 125 <laughs> years. 
no fires in its history, so touch wood. Touch steel, too. Troop says this was one of the first Canadian buildings built with steel beams. These probably came from a mill in Hamilton. So sturdy they will remain here, left for some future renovation to uncover and maybe find this signature. For many of us, Massey Hall is about the music, a stage for great performers. But it's also a showcase for a different group of artists, highly skilled craftspeople and tradesmen whose names we may have forgotten, but whose work lives on. There's a marrying of aesthetic and artistic elements with the underlying structure that allowed them to create such an amazing volume of a room. And ultimately, the volume of the room is what creates the sound and that's why Massey Hall is renowned the way it is. So, so there's a very interesting intersection between art and science here that's, that's reflected in, in what we're seeing right now. Such a cool tour. Okay, next on the National, camping out. Beautiful, peaceful way to spend an August evening in Canada, but doing it outside a fast food restaurant? We got two people saying hi. Hey guys, it's lovely. Lots of people. <laughs> Meet the first person and the many behind him in line for the first Jolly Bee in Edmonton. That's our moment, but first. In case you missed it, television informs, it entertains, and occasionally it just flat out confuses. Case in point, Henrico County, Virginia. Someone who we'll simply call television head has been leaving televisions at people's front door in the middle of the night with a wave. Everyone in my neighborhood last night was left a TV on their porch. Nobody knows who, and maybe more importantly, nobody knows why. There are probably as many theories as there are actual TVs. 65 at last count, by the way, including the one Jeannie Brooksbank got. Ten minutes later, my neighbor called, Stuart, and he said, oh my gosh, Jeannie, did you get a TV too? And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, I got a TV, and the people to my right got a TV, and the people to my left got a bigger TV. And I'm like, what? Within an hour, the, the county police came. They rounded up all the TVs, and if I had known it was going to go this viral, I would have kept my TV. Now, police say they don't see any real malicious intent, so charges don't seem likely here. But there's still the question of who. Police don't know, neither do the local media, but Jeannie's son Chase and his buddy Zach hope to succeed where others have failed. Basically, we're gonna investigate this. Oh my God, they're everywhere. Hey, if you have a theory about Television Head, we'd love to hear it. Just let us know through our story on the Nationals' Instagram page, or else, who knows, maybe before long, Television Head will pay you a visit. Jolly Bee has been called the McDonald's of the Philippines. A man from Edmonton kept hearing about the food from his mom. She'd eaten there and didn't stop raving about it. So the fear of missing out was just too much for Jordan Howard. Tomorrow, a Jolly Bee opens in Edmonton, and Howard wants to be the first customer, so he lined up three days ago. That passion for a certain kind of chicken is our moment. This is my home. It's very comfy, comfy cozy. I was already camping before I got here, so actually um, it was just another day, really. Here's my friend Japan. he's hanging out, high five. Yeah, I've made like a lot of friends actually. Um, it's been really, really fun. We've been, you know, taking turns sleeping here and there and guarding our stuff and having to go places to pee. The power went out for a little bit, so there wasn't a place to pee for a long time. It was, yeah, it's, it's an adventure. I don't, I don't, we're gonna start if I had a bed, at, uh, I wouldn't want to leave. Here's all the people. I think we got almost 100. It's like 80, 86 people. We all know each other. By name, we do roll call. To like, to make sure that nobody else tries to uh, sit here or something. It's it's really intense. It's very, it's all very democratic and all lovely. lovely I've never done this for anything. This is ridiculous. It's insane. Hey, guys, you want to say hi to CBC? Yeah. Hey, guys. A lot of people there, Andrew. So I, I've been to the Philippines. I've seen the restaurant. I've never gone in. Uh, and like you, kind of intrigued about what kind of food. But, but Andrew, what would you, uh, sort of not in an emergency situation, in normal day-to-day -day life, is there anything you'd line up for for 
three days and nights? No, no. I, I, I'd, I'd line up for 72 seconds. <laughs> That's about all the patience. I, I, I mean, I don't understand people who line up for, for concerts. I don't understand people who line up for, you know, the latest sneaker. And I, I certainly don't understand how people can line up for, for chicken. Yeah, I remember yeah. years ago when my kids were little and a Harry Potter book was coming out and it was being delivered by Courier, and I said to them, you know what? You can get it in the second week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It'll still be there, right? Anyway. It'll be exciting tomorrow in Edmonton at that rest. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Uh, hey, that's The National for this Thursday, August 15th. Have a good night. Good night.